And it's a beautiful Tuesday morning right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Great to have you join us on uh, Business Morning. I'm Ladi Williams. First off, let's uh, take a look at what's in the news. See, oil prices uh, uh, climbed today, regaining some of the ground lost in the previous day's uh, sharp losses and concerns over a possible disruption amid res uh, rising uh, geopolitical tensions in both Eastern Europe and the Middle East. We see Brent crude futures rose about 48 cents to $86.75 a barrel, uh, reversing a 1.8% fall in the previous session. U.S. Uh, West Texas intermediate crude futures climbed 34 cents to $83.65 a barrel, and haven't slid about 2.2% on Monday. All prices reached uh, seven-year highs last week, boasted by tight worldwide supply and uh, resurgent uh, global demand. And back here, Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo has uh, been highlighting the outcomes of the federal government's interventions, especially in terms of uh, job creation and poverty reduction. Professor Shibajo was uh, speaking at the launch of the Bank of Industries Aid and Productivity Report in Abuja, where he said that over 4 million jobs have been created with uh, credits and grants pegged at over $4 million disbursed over the past five years. Uh, Professor Oshibajo is also promising that more interventions are underway to boost the activities of the micro, small, and medium-term enterprises. Do take a listen. Government officials and members of the private sector at an event to appraise an intervention that commenced five years ago and to further strengthen the platform to engage more MSMEs through the provision of funding using targeted programs. Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibaju emphasizes the role of the MSME in economic recovery, promising further support for the sector. Today we witness the successes of a long and ambitious journey targeting and impacting MSMEs with interventions. The results, in my view, have far exceeded even what was envisioned. The infrastructure and processes that have been built to achieve this are nothing short of remarkable. Today, what we have is BOI's growth platform, Africa's largest infrastructure for direct interventions to MSMEs. With a credit and grants loan portfolio of over $400 million, the Bank of Industries programs, such as the Government Empowerment Enterprise Program, the Northeast Rehabilitation Fund, MSME Survival, amongst others, is ameliorating the plight of some entrepreneurs. But it is not yet through, and the Bank of Industry is unveiling a plan for 10 million Nigerians. As a bank, we are not resting on our laurels. We continue to expand our project portfolio and to reach out to MSMEs. At our pace of growth, we can impact up to 10 million MSMEs by 2025. There are also words from development partners. They are promising more commitments in growing MSMEs across the country. We believe that the market can work for the poor. Philanthropy can be a powerful way to ensure all people can benefit from advances in health and economic development. The World Bank partnered with the federal government and the state governments to provide swift policy response to viable yet vulnerable MSMEs that were urgently needing it. The overall objective of the Bank of Industry is to boost activities of MSME towards job creation, poverty reduction and self-reliance. All right, now to our first uh, conversation. Uh, running a business can be a daunting task with the headwinds ranging from uh, political risk, macroeconomic developments, security, government policy, and all pose risks to doing business in uh, any country. The Alliance uh, Risk Barometer recently released takes a look at these risks and how our countries rank. To tell us more, we have uh, Nira Deyemi, property and casualty expert, Alliance. Uh, great to have you on the program. Good morning. Good morning, Ryan. Yeah, so looking at this uh, risk uh, barometer uh, report, you know, it's quite interesting. It talks about a range of risk uh, to businesses in Nigeria. Uh, can you tell us more about this risk? Right. Um, so I'll begin with the uh, Alliance Risk Barometer. Um, it's a report that uh, uh, samples respondents from the Nigerians, which is worldwide. 
Uh, we talk about uh, the reasons that the businesses face. Uh, the respondents are process pursuits, uh, customers, risk expert, insurance, uh, managers, and senior managers of the uh, Claim to start as well, uh, giving us feedback on the risk. Um, top Globally, the top risk uh, for 2022 remains cyber incidents, uh, followed closely by business corruption, uh, natural catastrophe, and you know, pandemic out. Uh, bringing that back home to Nigeria, so cyber risk is top of the risk. And the uh, second risk that uh, uh, experts have said that the uh, biggest Nigeria is going to risk of violence. And the first time in uh, since 2018, um, that risk has come. Uh, the third risk is the uh, microeconomic development, and you know that this uh, uh, economic industries uh, affect badly affected by GDP, um, affected by productivity and economic health. Uh, and basically, this is what uh, this report. Uh, All right, you know, let's uh, drill down now to uh, cyber risk. Yeah, so. Uh, how much of a problem, you know, is it for Nigerian businesses? And, you know, how can they protect themselves from uh, cyber issues? Um, cyber risk, uh, as we go into the pandemic, became a real concern for businesses uh, globally and, of course, in Nigeria. Um, seems to have been a rise in malware attacks on businesses that uh, are internet to businesses. Uh, of course, the, the several factors, uh, which one of which was the pandemic, and people uh, an increase in remote work, with people having to work outside the business level. Of course, this, uh, this of course, was open, became an opportunity for cyber criminals to attempt to you know, attack attack system. Uh, this risk, of course, affects businesses that uh, we've seen uh, in the last couple of years, an increase in that. Now, um, across the globe, businesses have begun to, to put in security measures to ensure that to reduce that vulnerability. Uh, we've seen an increase in security parties that businesses have, have put in place. We've also seen an increase in multi-factor security protocols, as well as um, training extensively that businesses have put in uh, and to their business. Uh, we know also from the reports from what experts have said, that we, we expect that this, this is just continuing as people, you know, the, the knowledge of cyber risk continues to grow, as we continue to uh, uh, share the message on how businesses can protect them. Um, there's also, you know, cyber risk insurance available. A lot of businesses have also looked into that. And um, employment of uh, professional risk assessors, you know, to be able to help businesses manage their risk that and all of these things are in the you know, last couple of years to be able to ensure that we get uh, cyber risk. And, and this, this continues as we go on. Okay, I paint a picture of what, uh, you know, cost is like, you know, for business to, to actually protect themselves from these uh, cyber attacks. Well, uh, from the cost perspective, I say they, they make mostly two, two costs. Um, there's the cost, you know, that affects productivity and how it affects financial strength of the business, especially, you know, during this period. And there's also the cost of security outfit, you know, um, multi-factor authentication, for example, and don't come from free. And these security parties, a lot of them come with cost. Um, there's also the cost of the, the kind of service that are coming. So uh, an example is a lot of businesses would um, generally just reduce the how would I put on the scale of how a customer uses the system. So for example, we call also to call UI UX. The sacrifice, you know, UI UX for security. And um, the system become a lot more rigid because of, uh, of, of this uh, um, security threats. Um, also in the last couple of months we've also seen an increased expense uh, on, the, on the lines of the business in purchasing security uh, and solutions to mitigate the effects of, of this uh, um, cyber threat. And so this, this cause, you know, largely will affect the businesses who already are taking a hit, you know, from the pandemic. Um, don't forget that the pandemic is also a driving factor in this cyber risk. And most businesses and people now have to work remote. Um, this affects, of course, structural lines, 
they affect uh, raw materials moving to China cost, you know, to the business uh, as it is. And, you know, putting this cost back to the business at the end of the year or at the end of the financial period is fine at a huge cost, you know, to the business. Globally, there's been over uh, $1.1 billion spent on increased security because of cyber risk in the last year. And this um, cost will continue to grow from what they have done. All right. So, you know, we've talked about uh, political risk and violence, you know, macroeconomic developments. Top three Nigerian business risk in 2022. So I'm wondering, how can a business, you know, navigate these particular headwinds? Right. Um, so first of all, you know, you've talked about the, the drivers of, of, of political risk, being so mostly micro uh, macroeconomics. Of course, businesses we always say that when we talk about risk, one thing of two is flat. Uh, even though you may not be able to predict. Uh, when when you have this event, you must plan. Uh, we've seen an increase in businesses, uh, an improvement in their business continuity plan. Now, in the past, uh, business continuity plans or business continuity management used to be for uh, in the event of catastrophes or not. But we've now seen increasingly that businesses have begin, begun to incorporate uh, a crisis management, especially because of uh, political risk and violence in their business. Of course, this uh, means that the business continuity plan will be willing to um, adapt, you know, to the current problem. Uh, what we also know is that businesses now need to take care of their, of their um, people, which is the you know the biggest resource of any of any business, uh, from training to ensuring safety to ensuring that um, um, staff and people and uh, work and then also understand what needs to be done in the event of any of these risks. Uh, there are also special insurance coverages that are created to cover uh, uh, political risk and violence. Uh, we, we understand that this policy, of course, uh, would, would focus you know, on political risk in the event that you know, this is specialized. We know that also uh, strike riot and civil promotion, civil unrest, are extensions on this policy. A lot of um, alliance uh, companies uh, in different OEs across the world offer this, uh, this coverage. Um, also, again, as we talk about planning, uh, there are professional crisis management that businesses have now become um, began to hire and speak to on how to you know, survive when there is a political risk of you know, violence in the event of violence in, uh, as it affects them. There's also the, the risk of the uh, retail business. The last couple of years, we've seen that Retail businesses are one of the most key uh, when there's a political risk. Businesses have now begun to put in measures to ensure to reduce that exposure. You know, in terms of especially with uh, looting. And, and if you remember the exactly. uh, Ensa's uh, protests, you know the business. Yeah, a lot of be. retail businesses suffer that. Right. So of course we know that we, we've seen increased security. In that regard, uh, businesses, of course, have now also understood that they must have a relationship with law enforcement agencies and the different and government agencies responsible for safety and responsible for policy making, especially, you know, when thinking about political risk and violence. Uh, another, you know, uh, part of business is seriously hit when there's violence at the supply chain industry. You know, many times when there's political risk and violence, you find that businesses will be put on off. And routes and passages will be blocked off for either for repair or to forestall the spread of violence. And so everyone who's, who's now understands, who now understands this, they began to put in measures to ensure that they are protected from, from this system. Right. And another big issue is, you know, the pandemic outbreaks. You know, this remains a major uh, concern here with, you know, COVID-19 uh, variants, you know, popping up. Uh, what should businesses do to reduce the shock of, you know, say, another variant or another pandemic? So, interestingly, the report for 2022 shows that uh, across the globe, um, people have written pandemic as not, uh, not the most uh, biggest concern for their business you know, in the coming year. This means that businesses, as we speak now, have already started, you know, have plans in place to, to deal with uh, this pandemic or another pandemic. Don't forget that COVID-19 has not gone away yet. We've also just learned to manage it. Businesses just generally uh, um, believe that they, they are the 
And this brings me back to the point I mentioned earlier, which is planning. You know, uh, the, the top of, I won't talk about planning, we're talking about business opportunity management, we're talking about uh, security of these businesses, we're talking about increased remote work, we're talking about the staff, understanding what they need to do in the event of the pandemic. Of course, we, we, we have to commend those medical fields with the advances in science and how they've been able to come up with solutions for the COVID-19 pandemic. So there's increasing trust, you know, increased belief that should there be another pandemic, businesses are, are well prepared to, to, to deal. Uh, that does not mean that businesses should not do what they have to do to, to protect themselves, to protect their businesses, and to ensure that businesses are not closed in the event of another pandemic. But we'll continue again to come up with solutions. There's so many of those um, questions we have in the Alliance uh, with Parliament of the and you know uh, most of this uh, risk you know they lead to uh, business uh, interruptions you know S take for instance a, a business activity is interrupted now you know how, how does a company bounce back from that so uh, company again companies uh, need to update their response to the money um it is very important in this time. Um, the risk management framework is trusted world. And basically, it, it, it looks at what, what you need to do before this incident occurs and how you can manage this incident after the happen. Now, I talked earlier about insurance coverages, you know, that can help you for business interruption, for example, where you can get compensated to your business uh, premises. To so, sorry, to talk, talking your, about insurance, okay. talking about insurance, you know, Imagine a situation where there, there are too many claims, you know. How do how do the insurance companies actually uh, manage that? Well, we, we, we consider catastrophic losses that are not events uh, or large scale events. Um, the idea is that uh, you, you or just, there are people we call insurers, insurers, which are insurance companies that will carry you know, some of the risk that goes to the insurers. We also have um, uh, the opportunity to spread your risk, yeah, either across you know, insurance companies in the same planning, or you take the risk out to spread it. There's several risk management uh, efforts that insurance companies you know, already have in place to manage incidences of you know, large scale losses. Uh, we've, we've seen some large scale losses brought about by hurricanes, we've seen some by floods and tsunamis, and, and you know, the insurance companies often always have a way to manage. Although, in some situations, uh, the government would have to step in, you know, to manage some of these losses to take care of them. But largely, the insurance companies have mechanisms in place, you know, to manage large-scale losses, catastrophic losses, a lot, a lot of them, you know. And also, uh, with the, the terrorism, uh, terrorism extension of the certain policies, uh, like the business interruption policies, the strike right and civil promotion policies, um, you know, also their network of insurance companies can, you know, can manage these losses. You know, of course, when we're talking about risk, don't expect that all of this is going to be So, uh, except for, you know, large-scale um, protests or violence, or, you know, we do expect that the entire you know, region, the entire country, the country, it's not like it's not an impossibility. It's just that it's not you know, expected that at the same time, the entire region would have a uh, large-scale violence, you know, that would affect the insurance companies or the risk companies in this place to manage so I think that that can be right. All right, you know, talking about natural catastrophes and uh, climate change, you know, we also have it points to the issue of uh, ESG. You know, uh, let's talk about making businesses weatherproof at this point. So um, climate change remains a big concern. Um, businesses that were inspired that last few years, there's been concerted effort to get everybody on board to understand how they contribute to climate change. And what they can do to improve you know, the, the, the future of, of our planet. Um, businesses already understand also that those who do uh, carbon emissions need to reduce or eliminate emissions. Businesses have started doing environmental friendly uh, uh, business practice. You know, also we understand that climate change affects certain industries much more than it affects some industries. Uh, we understand, you know, supply chain industry already. Um, understand how it affects them. The food industry understands how climate change is. And we think that uh, even though they are insurance coverage, business practices in terms of lifestyle change 
in terms of the machinery use begin to, to, to improve to accommodate the changes that we, that All right. we want to see in climate and, and okay. businesses continue to, to, to do stuff to ensure that the input step is going be all right, all right, uh, Nira Deemi. Um, thank you so much for coming on the program, property and uh, casualty expert at Alliance. Thank you for breaking down uh, the report to us. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, after the break, uh, commodities market update is next. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. All right, so the ongoing Dangote refinery, petrochemical, and subsea pipeline infrastructure uh, projects continue to receive commendation from various stakeholders. The president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Kiyomi Adishino, has described it as Africa's growth acceleration company. The AFDB president said this during his visit to the facilities in Lagos, where he applauded the president of Dangote Group for his vision to develop Africa through industrialization. Do take a listen. It's an august occasion for the Dangote Group as the AFDB team, led by its president, Akimumi Adishino, visits the Dangote World Class Project in Ibeduleki, Lagos. The tour takes him to the largest subsea pipeline infrastructure in the world, 1,100 kilometers, set to handle 3 billion standard cubic foot of gas per day. The team also visits the world's second largest urea plant with a capacity of 3 million tons per annum. The world scale gas treatment station, petrochemical complex, 555 megawatts power plant, 500 kiloton per annum polyethylene plant, and a central control room. So we have, we call this uh, the technology among the technology. The team rounds off the tour at the largest single train petroleum refinery in the world, sited on 148,900 pilings and with a processing capacity of 650,000 barrels of crude oil in a day. What has gone into the project and the expected outcome and impact are simply mind-blowing, according to the AFDB president. I see a company that I will proudly call Africa Growth Accelerator Company. So if you want to call this company, just call it AGAC, Africa Growth, Africa's Growth Acceleration Company. And why do I say that? You see an acceleration of how to reduce imports. You see an acceleration of how to have an outbound on export. You see an acceleration on value chain development here, on how to make them competitive regionally and also globally. Meanwhile, the president of the Dangote Industries, Aliko Dangote, expresses gratitude at the support the project has enjoyed from the federal government as well as the African Development Bank. Without the support of the government, uh, you know, the central bank and the bankers, I mean, developing banks like yours, there is no way we would have actually succeeded in building this massive, uh, you know, uh, industrial, uh, you know, pack. I mean, it's a major revolution. Once we finish, uh, definitely, you know, it will put Nigeria on the map. According to Ali Kudangote, the refinery is expected to commence production by the third quarter of 2022. Quite a massive project there. Let's uh, bring in additional this morning now. Research analyst, uh, financial directives company. Uh, great to have you. Uh, it's been a while. Hey, laddie. Good morning, and thank you for having me. <laughs> good Definitely morning. Been a while. Oh, yeah. So uh, looking at the Dangote refinery, you know, scheduled to commence operations, you know, in the third quarter of this year, Quite an incredible feat there. Uh, the capacity of about 540,000 barrels per day. Uh, what are your thoughts on this development? Uh, I think, first of all, it's a brilliant development. It's been, it's been in the works for a while now. Started in um, 2013, 
cost around 16 to 18 billion US dollars. But it's positive in the sense that Nigeria, one of the biggest problems we have in Nigeria is you know, importing uh, 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 petroleum products, importing premium auto spirit, and which is, is, is costly in terms of the import bill and also weighs heavily on the external on the on the weighs heavily on the on the exchange rate as well as the external reserve. So with this, I think I wouldn't say this is a silver bullet that solves all Nigeria's problems, but I think it will significantly reduce you know pressures uh, on the exchange rate by reducing Nigeria's import bill particularly for, for uh, petroleum products. It will also, because the, the plant also is going to export, you know, uh, uh, some PMS to PMS and other, you know, products to neighboring countries. So we're also going to enjoy some um, FX inflows. Also, I think it's positive for investors, comp uh, investors sentiment uh, coupled with the petroleum industry bill. So overall, I think it's, it's, it's very good for Nigeria. Yeah, but you know, this is we still we still have you know the energy transition issue. You know, major companies are moving away from you know dirty uh, alternatives. You know, so uh, what do you think about the timing, though? Well, I think the movement towards you know the greener greener energy is not going to happen overnight. It's, it's going to be a gradual process. So in sen in that sense, I'll say that you know it is still it is still um, it's still good. It's still a positive development. I mean, even in the UK here, the transition to net zero is around 2050. So it's still a very, very, very long time. And up on, before then, I mean, we have to make some progress in the in, in the domestic market. So improving domestic uh, refinery capacity in Nigeria, I think that is very, very uh, positive, regardless of the transition towards, you know, uh, greener or cleaner energy sources. Right. All right. L let's look at you know oil prices now. We see uh, at uh, eighty-seven dollars per barrel on the global uh, commodities market. You know, it's all talk about supply concerns and uh, geopolitical tensions. What other factors are driving oil prices at this time? Um, like you said, like the oil prices have topped um, reached seven-year seven-year highs of around eighty-eight dollars per barrel. Yet, to, and they've increased around like 10, 12 percent yet to date driven by many factors. One is a uh, demand supply gap. So demand exceeds supply by around like 1.5 uh, million barrels per day and has increased from, from December up until January. We also seen some demand factors like, you know, expectations that oil demand is going to reach pre-pandemic levels this year. On the supply hand, you are seeing one uh, 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 spare capacity issues. I mean, OPEC, Plan to in OPEC Plus, you know, plan to increase their output by around 400,000 barrels a day, uh, 400,000 barrels a day monthly, but they've been struggling to do that. So that raises questions about spare capacity. That even if there's a need to increase supply, that OPEC Plus is struggling to meet such you know increases in supply. For example, look at Nigeria. Nigeria's um a, a quota oil production quota by OPEC is around 1.8 million barrels per day. But look at December, November, they were only able to produce, or we were only able to produce around 1.3 million barrels by the same story with, with, uh, with Angola. In addition to that, we have some uh, geopolitical tensions. I mean, there's, there's tensions between Russia and the West over Ukraine, and that you know, has the potential to threaten oil output, particularly because of Russia is the largest non-OPEC producer. In the Middle East also, we have some geopolitical tensions with the United Arab Emirates. So all of these factors are what is are, are, are driving oil prices forward. In terms of short-term factors, we're also seeing a stronger US dollar. Um, yesterday, the dollar strengthened against the basket of other currencies against the back that against the backdrop of you know expectations of normalization in US um, um, interest rates. Yeah, so we have so many uh, factors uh, pushing markets right now. But, you know, still on uh, domestic oil production, you know, the federal government has postponed the removal of petrol uh, subsidy, which was planned for uh, July this year. Should we be cheering or crying here? <laughs> it's a mix. I think, okay, so let's, let us argue, let us um, evaluate the arguments for and against subsidy removal. In terms of the arguments for subsidy removal, the, the, the proponents of that say that, you know, there's a heavy fiscal burden. I mean, it's estimated around 1 trillion to 2 trillion naira that is spent on subsidy per annum. And the argument is that it is not sustainable. Nigeria is not a particularly rich country. So spending 1.1 or 2 trillion naira on 1.1 to 2 trillion, you know, naira on subsidy 
paranorm is huge and is not sustainable. They also argue that, you know, the benefits don't really trickle down to the people that really, really need it. Looking at the arguments against subsidy removal, people talk about the timing, particularly now that Nigeria is still recovering from the adverse effects of, of, of the coronavirus pandemic. Removing the subsidy now could see, you know, uh, 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 the price of PMS in the domestic market increase to as high as, you know, 300, 350 Naira per litre. But also that could, you know, stoke uh, inflationary pressures and that could, you know, further push people into poverty. Already last year, the World Bank estimated that, you know, the pandemic pushed around 7 million Nigerians into poverty. So the timing, in addition to that, remember that 2022 is a pre-election year. So now there's always the suspicion that whatever, you know, decision that is going to be made by the government has, you know, political political um, undertones. I think a better option or a more optimal way to remove, you know, petroleum subsidy would be to improve, you know, domestic refining capacity, like what we have with Dangote, if and when it comes on stream, I mean, it's scheduled to come on stream in the third quarter of, of this year. I mean, this is not the first time we are here that's going to come on stream today, tomorrow. So if it does come on stream, then that is a positive step towards easing subsidy, towards, towards you know, removing the petroleum subsidy, because now it will reduce you know, the dependence on importing um, PMS. All right. Well, okay. Uh, let, let me stop there. Okay. Let me stop <laughs> all right. All right. This so you know it's MPC uh, decision day here, and uh, you know even we're waiting for the feds uh, later on. You know, there's a general consensus among analysts that the MPC will hold all monetary policy uh, parameters on change today at the meeting. Uh, what are the key uh, considerations, and how will this affect the average uh, Nigerian on the street? Okay. Thank you for that, for that question, Lady. So. The key considerations for the monetary policy committee at this moment, one is, um, I think, the inflation rates. Inflation rates, you know, that's the big accelerated in the, room. the past eight yeah. months, and you know, just increased in, in in December. I think that that was, I, I mean, it's too early to say if that's an inflection point, if that's a, a change in the trajectory of of inflation. I think it's too early to say. I think uh, the, the the increase in inflation was a marginal increase to fifteen point six percent was driven by you know, seasonal factors, festivities, and so on. So one key factor is, 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 is the inflation rate. Second one is the growth rate. In, in Nigeria's currently um, average growth rate for 2020 from, general, from Q1 to Q3 is around 3%, which is positive, it's modest, but it's still fragile. So I think the central bank is also going to focus on, on you know, looking at uh, uh, um, economic growth, trying to consolidate the gains in economic growth. Uh, uh, growth. We're also going to look at factors like the exchange rates, you know, higher oil prices in the in the global commodities market. Looking at Nigeria's oil uh, production, also the struggles with Nigeria's oil production, and other factors like that. I mean, but this is again against the background, against the backdrop of expectations of higher interest rates in the global in the global economy. I mean, the United States is is expected to to signal uh, uh, to increase interest rates are by around four times this year, starting in March. Also, they're expected to stop their, um, you know, their uh, quantitative easing program, I think, in March. Similarly, the Bank of England, I mean, started already, was the first to start increasing um, interest rates in their last meeting, I think, in December. And their next meeting next month, they're also expected to increase it some more by, I think, 25 basis points. So even against this backdrop, I think that at this time, the optimal policy policy uh, uh, action would be to hold monetary policy uh, 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 okay. parameters Look, unchanged. Looking at you know global uh, hikes now, that would weigh on uh, 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 foreign uh, uh, taking foreign loans at this point. Yes, it will. It will definitely increase the cost of uh, uh, the cost of servicing Nigeria's external debt. It could also trigger you know capital flights. You know pressure on the currencies, as well as, you know, uh, dollar-denominated uh, 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 bonds. But however, we need to take our local context into consideration. The central bank has report, repeatedly, you know, emphasized that, you know, some of the key drivers of inflation in Nigeria are not monetary factors. And as a result, monetary policy is kind of handicapped against, against you know, these drivers of inflation. Some of the key drivers of inflation are insecurity, you know, banditry in, 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 in farmlands, 
legacy factors such as you know the infrastructure deficits infrastructure deficits logistic issues and for these kind of issues monetary policy is kind of limited or is constrained in in, in targeting this this uh, uh, issue so if you know what i mean you can also evaluate all of the arguments look even look at the argument for tightening while you know it might help you know theoretically Rating inflation it would it could also help you know attract foreign portfolio investment, but it will raise the cost of funds, which will kind of reverse some of the the, the benefits, some of the economic growth that Nigeria right. has been able to right. to, to achieve uh, right. um, last year. Right, this is like choosing between the devil and the deep blue sea here. <laughs> all right, uh, <laughs> all right, this is like all eyes uh, on the MPC uh, today. We'll be covering that live right here on Channels Television. Thank you so much, uh, Desola, for coming uh, on the program today. We'll take a moment now. All right, let's take a look at what's happening in the market uh, with Will. Will, we saw that pullback yesterday. It's called the MPC meeting today. <laughs> Lady, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm thinking that, but I'm just hoping that it's not. But, you know, investors, they tend to just act, react to market you know, news and what's happening in the market. Investor and reaction. They, yes. Mm -hmm. The first reaction is caution. I'm like, yeah. what do I do? What do I not do? Do I pull back? Do I stay in? But we're just going to hope and see what the market, um, how it plays out today, especially after right. the decision of the Central Bank's Monetary Policy Committee. So we'll just see. But we saw a bit of a pullback yesterday, 0.06% in the uh, all-share index. It's certainly now at 45,928.27 points. Uh, we see that the month to date, oh, that the year to date gain actually is now about 7.5% uh, because of a slight pullback. Now we're talking about 7.5% for the year to date gain, now, which is actually really good. Now the market sentiment was negative by a very wide margin. We saw 23 losers in yesterday's trading session against four gainers, four stocks gained yesterday, 14 stocks. I mean, now the total volume of trades increased by about 1.1% to 278.61 million units. Now it was valued at about 2.89 billion naira and exchanging over 4,400 deals. Now surplus topped the chart for the most traded stock by value. The stock has been trading since last week really hot. The share price has really climbed. Now we're seeing, the, well, I'm not, we're hoping for, uh, not for a correction, but possibly a correction might happen. Now analyzing by sectors, we saw insurance and the banking sectors, um, industrial goods, uh, consumer goods, they were down yesterday. Oil and gas was the lone gainer. But we have Phil Anegbe to tell us what really went down the market yesterday. Phil Anegbe, uh, research analyst at Cardinal Stone Securities. Good morning, Phil. Yeah, good morning, Will. Thank you for having me on the show. It's good to have you again, Phil. Now, Phil, is decision today, I mean, decision day today for the Central Bank's Monetary Policy Committee. Now, is the pullback we're seeing in the market already reactionary or is it just investors cashing out? Yeah, we think that it's a mix of uh, reactions to um, possible outcomes of the MPC, uh, scheduled uh, treasury bill uh, auctions, as well as uh, uh, board meetings ahead of the release of full year results. So, as well as uh, you may have a bit of profit taking. So, all four factors may be uh, may have driven the repricing we saw in the market. So, profit taking, uh, expectations around the MPC, uh, possible outcome of treasury bill auctions as well as the uh, loads of board, meet, uh, board meetings we are seeing ahead of the release of full year. Uh, oh, it looks like we lost field there. Now we're talking about the losses in the market. We saw that GT Co, Nigerian Breweries, Oando, UBA, Unilever, all lost in yesterday's trading session. Now we're looking at and hoping that the Central Bank's Monetary Policy Committee would not affect so much equities, especially companies, their valuation. If the Central Bank chooses to hike the rates, how would that affect the, the, the valuation of stocks in the market? Will consumers, or I mean investors, continue to purchase the stocks? Will they want to pull back and move into probably safe havens like the fixed income market. We saw that yesterday uh, for the fixed income market, the volume of transactions there was a bit slightly bullish. The investors, well, not so much of transaction happening for the 2026 bill there, uh, paper there, then the, we saw for the 2027 paper, it's also not so good. We're just seeing for the treasury bills, and it, like the treasury bills opened the market really, really on a very mixed sentiments as the market participants continue to trade, traded cautiously, awaiting today's decision from the Central Bank of Nigeria. And we're hoping that um, that will set the you know, direction for how yields will you know, go for the rest of the week. And we'll see if, you know, 
interest were across the clubs. The, 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 the average rate dipped by about nine basis points, despite the over maturity we saw yesterday, and also the FAC inflow that came in from last week. Well, that there's, I think the liquidity is, is, is loosened up a little bit. It's not as tight as it was, Laddie, and we are just hoping that that will help to tide the, 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 the sector and the system and not make investors yeah. want to run out of it and probably keep the money. But we just hope that the CBN chooses to retain rates and not hike it. But it's like you say, it's a right. mixed, mixed reactions from investors. <laughs> mixed, and I, I, we don't know where it's going to go. We're just hoping that it's going to be for the best. Or, or, yes, you know, it's, 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 it's going quite to be interesting times for an average investor. You know, right now, everyone's searching for that safe haven. Where is the safe haven? <laughs> we, we don't know. Now, inflation is about 15.63% yes. as it is. And people are wondering how, if they hike the rates and higher than what we have now, how are people going to invest? That's a tough how decision. are we going to borrow? How are we going decision. to get credits? You don't want to stifle growth, businesses. You know. So it's, it's really a tough one for the central bank. And we just really in a tight position right yeah. now. They don't know, we, should they hike? Should they retain? So we just watch and we'll see. We'll just like watch and say. see. Like, we'll All say, we're taking it live today. And so we'll see what's going to really happen. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, Will. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Matt. All right. Uh, after the break, uh, we'll, take, uh, uh, we'll take a look at what's happening in the UK. That's the moment. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. All right. Welcome back. Let's uh, take a look at what's happening in the UK with uh, Juliana. Uh, good morning, Juliana. So uh, data from the Office for National Statistics uh, shows the cost of service in the country is $2 trillion plus Debt pile was almost 200% uh, up in uh, December 2020. I guess it's still the pangs of inflation there. Uh, good morning, Laddie. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, it does appear as if... Um, as, sorry, I have some feedback in my ears. It's really difficult for me to talk at the moment. Oh, um, sorry. But yes, it does appear um, to show that um, inflation, which we know is running... Um, higher uh, at its highest level in 30 years is affecting government debt. Uh, so to service uh, the two trillion plus uh, that the government is owing is cost during the month of December over eight billion pounds. As you said, this is a 200 percent increase on what it was um, in December 2020. There are a number of, of factors here. I believe government bonds are tied to the retail price index not the consumer price index. Consumer price index, or CPI, is running at about 5.2%, uh, whereas retail price index is currently running at about 8.4%. So it's not great, and it comes at a time where uh, Chancellor Rishi Shunak is under increasing pressure uh, to, to, to put the coffers back in the government purse. Uh, we know that uh, there's going to be a national insurance tax hike in April, um, we're waiting for Ofgem, the energy regulator, to increase the price cap because of these soaring energy prices. And then, of course, he's woken up with this bill on his doorstep. Not a great uh, start to the week for the government, amongst all the other issues they're facing at the moment. Really not a great start. Well, well according to a long-running uh, consumer survey, uh, Britons complain more about their treatment at the hands of uh, businesses last year than any other uh, year on record. What are you hearing about this? Yeah, quite interesting. Um, of the 10,000 uh, people that the Institute of Customer Service spoke to, 13% of people uh, last year had made a complaint. Um, most of this uh, was related uh, to COVID-19, um, various issues um, about supply, about delivery, about service. I think um, it, it's pretty common to be in the UK and you hear somebody say, you just don't get the service anymore, or somebody saying, can I speak to the manager? And they say, unfortunately, I am the manager. That <laughs> appears um, to be, oh, okay, you've experienced that too, have you, Laddie? Oh, that yes. appears to be um, the issue here in the UK. But of course, we know COVID has been a huge burden Unfortunately, there is a labour shortage. There is over a million plus vacancies out there. Um, lots of hospitality venues are running um, on short staff. People are waiting longer. And so it's really interesting, actually. And the fact that it's 13 percent does show that there has been an increase. I think this is the highest the survey said they've um, witnessed since they started the survey in 2008. Uh, but I think we could probably give these businesses an easier time because we know COVID has been so devastating.
Yeah, let's uh, cut them some slack. All right, Juliana, thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. You too, thanks. All right, now let's uh, look at what's happening in the crypto market. Uh, surprisingly, there was a bounce uh, yesterday after incredible sell-offs. You saw uh, the Nasdaq sell off to the Nasdaq, and it did have a bounce too, and uh, Bitcoin uh, kind of recovered. Uh, see a, a, a recovery rally there happening in the market. Uh, we see uh, market cap, the $1.62 trillion uh, volume traded is uh, quite up this morning, $126.88 billion traded in, in the total crypto market. Let's look at uh, Bitcoin. See Bitcoin uh, trading in positive territory there. Uh, 42,005 and 42,008. The price is trading below the 43,005 level. And the hourly simple moving average, there's a key uh, contracting uh, triangle. Let's look at Ethereum there. What's happening with Ethereum? You see Ethereum there, $2,372, down about 2.93%. Uh, uh, volume traded, $27.7. Uh, zero billion dollars but you see ethereum is not recovering as strong as bitcoin uh, was actually uh, let's uh, look at the top alts by market cap there we see let's see what's happening we see uh, lrc there up about eight uh, percent loop ring one of the oldies there in the market it's six cents up about 8.53 percent and we see a uh, wool network there up 7.80 percent and uh, phantom phantom tried to recover there got as low as a dollar, about a dollar ninety-one cents yesterday, and we see that bounce also uh, impacted Phantom. That looking good, up about six point uh, six nine percent. Okay, be there twenty-one dollars uh, forty-two cents. It's up five point four three percent, and we see uh, Elrond one hundred and thirty-two dollars. Elrond, uh, one of the oldies to there. It's uh, up about four point seven six percent. Let's look at the top uh, losers there. You see Dash down about 8%. Let's talk to uh, Rume now. Hello, Rume. Good morning, Ladi. Good morning, Rume. <laughs> yeah, so we saw a bounce from nowhere yesterday with uh, risky assets. You saw tech-heavy Nasdaq, uh, Bitcoin followed. How are you seeing the market? Yeah, this uh, is a sell-off. And um, the market is, uh, like we always say, it's not a get rich quick scheme. People should be careful and manage their risk effectively. Um, all of the things happening in the world, they have, it has it having its um, impact on the market. And um, soon we're going to bounce back, but um, fingers crossed, we have to be able to manage our risk very well because a lot is actually happening. And I don't think uh, we, are, we are actually done with this uh, market sell-up. Yeah, there's a high level of uh, leveraging the market and it's um, really scary and a lot of the news from uh, Ukraine and Russia here and there and also interest rates rising and inflation it has its own turn on cryptocurrencies as well so uh, we hope to bounce back soon uh, because a lot of people actually doing uh, involved in this industry are actually looking at it as, uh, as uh, a tech stock kind of you know instead of uh, a digital gold which some of us believe that we are doing and is the future of money. So hopefully, I think we're going to see a relief very soon, but I don't think uh, this is the relief that we need yet. This is just uh, the yeah, actual, Robert. Just the short time and stuff, yeah. All right, and well, you know, we've we've had a couple of people talk about uh, Bitcoin being a good hedge against inflation. How's that hedge going? Okay. Uh, Bitcoin is a good um, hedge against uh, inflation, right? Because if you, if you, if you check uh, statistics from all that happened in uh, the 13, 13 years of Bitcoin, as this you can see it has average about 200% um, percent on a yearly basis. And um, if you ask me what has happened uh, in the Philippines, it's, uh, it's a very good example. I was uh, looking at the material yesterday. It says that about uh, in every five Filipinos, one of them ha actually has uh, a crypto asset, which means that uh, we, in as Nigerians, we are not alone. Other parts of the world are uh, mm -hmm. also aware. And one of the very striking things that people need to understand right about now is that all of the countries that are holding all of this digital asset have one thing in common, which is poverty and bad economic policies from different uh, parts of the world and um, unemployment and all of those 
um, vice is disturbing um, the, the, their country. So aside the U.S., all of these guys are uh, looking for alternative ways to able to make a life for themselves. Like you see that our case is uh, very very peculiar. These people hardly hardly eat and they hardly do a few things for themselves, and they have to survive. So the best way to do it is to edge their phone for uh, possible inflation to uh, come come to wreck it. So. It is actually effective, and in doing that, you also need to apply certain caution. Like, oh, don't put all your money. You can dollar cost average in popularly called DCA. So you buy a fraction at the point in time. You use your you say, certain percentage of your earnings every month to buy fractions, and it makes a lot of sense that way when the market pans back, which is yeah. a very short period, and it could happen. I, you did uh, mention the Philippines. There we see the Union Bank of Philippines said to offer custodial services for. Uh, crypto assets. Seems that demand is quite high there for virtual assets. Yeah, because uh, the people are poor, and uh, the best way to actually solve all of this situation is to see how to help themselves and not allow the value. Because the value of each of these currency, when the inflation is high, that means you need to pay more for 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 value. But the fact that inflation doesn't affect people because Bitcoin itself, which is the flagship, has a fixed monetary um, policy. There will only be 21 million Bitcoin right in existence. So uh, I don't think any of this country has uh, the amount uh, of cash being printed uh, to be fixed. You know, so they just print and print. And the more you print all of this currency, I don't know how all of the central banks monitor all of this, thing, but I'm very sure that the central bank chiefs don't know how much of fiat that is in circulation right about now. So that is a challenge. You know, so you edge your phone to crypto, and at the end of the day, it gives you that um, confidence that since we have this system, a time will come for it to be scarce and the price will be appreciated. And uh, hopefully less volatility, Ruby. Exactly. Yes, we can. Because <laughs> the more people come in, the, the less volatile it will because obviously. This is it's very young asset, you ask me. Okay. All right, Rumi. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest Always of the day. Always a pleasure, buddy. Always a pleasure. All right, so uh, yeah, we see Bitcoin there trading at thirty-five thousand nine hundred eighty-one dollars. There, uh, five losers there. The top losers we see uh, Dash leading that count is down eight point three one percent, and we see uh, Pancake Swap. It's down about five point two one percent at seven dollars uh, thirty-four cents a coin. All right, that's a wrap on the program. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to join us at one thirty for Business Incorporated and a special coverage of the MPC Decision Day. Uh, that's uh, later on. Uh, do uh, do uh, uh, set your ca your uh, watch for that. Don't uh, miss it. We'll see how the central bank is going to push forward their decision today. All right. Thank you for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.